is Max. I am several million years old, I've recently discovered. My birth certificate says I'm 21. Government issued IDs don't tell the whole story, do they? I was born and raised among the evergreens of western Washington. In this life, that is. Then, when I turned 17, my father suddenly lost his job, and we were quickly forced to move quite a ways inland. I didn't think I was going to mind living in the high desert, with its dissociated dryness and sparseness of vegetation. But what I didn't know was the majority of people in the particular city we had landed in, over its hundred and sixty some odd year history, had taken on many of the characteristics of their physical environment. Compared to the people of Washington State, which was all that I had to go on at the time, the people here were cold, like the high desert winters, and seemed to be cerebrally dry, devoid of any of the intellectual vegetation that I had become so accustomed to in the Northwest. There were no warm welcomes here, no heartfelt handshakes, no gleeful invitations to sit by the hearth, no expectant ears that yearned for stories of far-off lands. There were no normal friendliness at all. Of course, I eventually made a friend or two in our new environment, after investing no small portion of time and energy. In all actuality, what really happened was that nobody would say much more than a single word to me until I eventually, and hesitantly, decided to show off a couple of my God-given talents. On the whole, I have never liked to outwardly flaunt my skills. It was never in my nature to seek approval from others. But at least in this rare case, I suddenly felt that it had become necessary to show off. Just a little. In order to find that thing that every single living creature needs. A friend. So I gave a little performance at our high school talent show and it worked like a charm. I'd written a song and had played a couple different musical instruments on stage. And after the show, I had more friends than I knew what to do with. Eventually, I realized that most of these people were not really friends at all. They were just people that wanted to gain proximity to me because I could do something cool, something real. From that wave of boisterous plebeians, I was eventually able to extract one real friend. The friend he remained throughout our schooling. Then came graduation. The ultimate step onward. Everyone was so captivated. To me, it was nothing more than another mindless ceremony. One more definitive moment our elders could use to further brainwash us about the proper ways to become slaves to the grandiose, meaningless existence that was supposedly meant for us on planet Earth. Well, now I know better. For a while I tried to make it in the world. I tried to fit into the program. I never even came close. Why? Because I never really wanted to fit in. Don't get me wrong, of course I wanted to have a few of the luxuries that so many others didn't have access to outside of the free world. I thought briefly that I might like to see what it was like to become an executive with nearly unlimited resources and a host at my command. But what orders would I be commanding such a group? The central focus of corporate law is to make as great a financial profit as humanly possible. And to accomplish this, the primary objective of a corporate executive is to use a metaphoric hammer in order to extract a continuously greater and greater profit from its laborers. But in all current corporations I have ever seen, the laborers have, of course, been human. And to drive out all inefficiencies from them would then be to drive out humanism itself. I love efficiency as much as any other scientist. But the planet Earth is humanistic because it has humanity as its foundation. Now, because of my current and highly unusual position in life, I have taken a dualistic view of humanism. This view is as follows. About one in a hundred million people are currently readying themselves for a true graduation. This graduation is very different from that of high school, where only a few things change. 
This graduation is absolute. It is the abandonment of physical life in preference to something greater. Of course, this idea would be absolutely shocking to the average person who is not even close to being ready to give up physical life. And it's not because their physical bodies aren't ready. It's because their minds will not be ready to handle the idea of life without physical cause and effect. They cannot yet handle the idea of being sky-born. But I can. I have dreamt of it since I was a small child. I began dreaming of flying when I was only five years old. As I grew older, the idea of flying became more than just a physical fantasy. By the time I was an early teenager, I was already in love with the idea of flying with my mind. I practiced it every single day. And as my mind continued to grow, I yearned for greater and greater separation from my physical body. I knew that the physical weight of my human body was far too great to travel at any great speed, any speed approaching the speed of light, that is. And, aside from a purely physical standpoint, my mind continued to grow in ways that made me constantly question normal human philosophical values. For instance, why did I have to look outside myself in the first place? for my daily labors, for fulfillment, even for a mate. I felt inside me that my soulmate must be much, much more than just another random person of the opposite sex, who just so happened to have one or two things in common with me. Now, as I was going through all this external strife and asking all these internal questions, I was also reading voraciously. I had begun studying many arcane subjects and eventually stumbled upon the subject of esoteric spirituality. After a few years of delving into the most profound literary material I had ever encountered, I suddenly began to realize a holistic connection between all the ostensibly disparate elements that I had previously regarded as separate. And these connections began to multiply exponentially during the time within which I eventually realized that I had psychic powers. Yes, I was beginning to see things automatically, as if my mind could travel by itself. And I was even beginning to see the future, at least in some small part. And as great as this seemed to me at the time, it was nothing compared to what was about to happen. The greatest realization of my entire life came to me as I was sitting in my car late one night. I just left a convenience store, and as I sat there in my car, I saw a robbery take place. As I said before, I'm not one to brag, but in order to put this little story in its proper perspective, I must relate to you that I am a superhuman. No, not like Superman. I can't fly around the earth so fast it reverses time. But I am one of a very special class of people known as the Ubers the very first of the world's real superheroes. We are a family of people who are genetically enhanced due to advanced evolution. One aspect of this enhancement is that the Ubers are much more intelligent than average. This was the first feature of my genetic transcendence that came to my attention, and at a very early age. By the time I was in ninth grade, I could already play five musical instruments and was studying hyperdimensional physics in my spare time. We, Ubers, are also generally superior in physical attributes. For instance, I could ride a unicycle at eight years old, something which none of my peers could do. By the time I was in high school, I was extremely strong and agile, and could perform advanced feats of acrobatics that seemed very impressive to onlookers. But back to the robbery. As I watched it take place, I was initially moved to run in and use my Uber gifts to stop what was occurring inside. But as I reviewed my recent history in the store, I suddenly put my initial reaction on pause. I had seen the robbers pretending to shop only moments earlier. They were a couple classic thugs who obviously were not planning on fulfilling any true needs. They weren't putting bread on their family's tables. And the clerk who had taken my money only one minute earlier had been completely unresponsive to my friendly greeting and had gone through the motions of his job as if he was no more than a cyborg created by the corporation that he so begrudgingly served. These seemed like people who really needed me to waltz in and save the day. 
The perpetrators of the crime were so behind in their minds that I reasoned they actually needed to complete at least one such job so that they would be able to use the future memory of the experience in a transformative way, but only after some time of active criminality. The corporation in question had more profits than they knew what to do with. The slave that they had hired was barely even alive at the register. He obviously needed some measure of negative or even shocking experience to cause his awakening. An awakening that a great many people were also currently awaiting in their lives. And if these sound like strange conclusions to make, you should know that I did not make them all by my lonesome. There was actually with me that night the voice of some great spirit. Not a booming godlike voice, but a tiny, subtle voice that spoke tiny little elements of wisdom into my ears. The voice seemed infinitely tranquil, as if it belonged to an entity who had lived for eons. So the first incident passed, and as the months pressed on, the voice grew ever stronger. After my 21st birthday, the voice took on greater and greater attributes and proportions. First I could see the vague motions of the tongue and two lips. Then I began to see the faintest elements in the face when the voice was speaking to me. Eventually I could see the entire upper body of a personage. A personage who came to call himself Ashik, the fire giver. He told me a great many things about the world around me, about my biological family, and about myself. He told me that I had lived hundreds of lives on the earth. One as a hunter, the next as a fur trader, one as a servant, and the next as a master. He told me that I had been a great king in medieval Europe, but that I had made a few serious mistakes that had necessitated my future existence as a middle class American, so that I might learn to better myself and to make amends for my past wrongdoings. My many conversations with Ashik had finally come to a head. He told me some months ago that my journey here on Earth was nearly complete, and I was about to learn some great secret that would finally unlock the shackles that had kept me in prison since the dawn of man. He then left me, and I have not seen him since. But he did tell me one last thing. He said that, when the moment of my great enlightenment came, I would suddenly be filled with an immensely powerful fire that even as I took on my new and perfected body of fiery light, I would fall, henceforth, out of the gaze of mortal men, and then, like him, only be seen when I momentarily desired it. But time is nigh. Now what was it that needed to be learned across a span of millions of years that I had never quite learned in all those eons of time? That part is a bit complicated. I'm afraid you'll have to discover that information for yourself when your own time comes. For now, I will bid you farewell. You may look now and again for my sign in the east, and the cock fellows his feathered chest, for your 